Uh, my name's, <laughs> my name's uh, Rob Lewis. I'm the uh, neurosurgeon. I'm the director of the Skull Base and Pituitary Program here at Hogue. Um, been here about 18 months. I uh, was recruited here um, from John Wayne Cancer Institute to start this program at Hogue, um, mainly because, because there was a need for it. Most of these patients have been traditionally having to go up to UCLA um, or, or even further away to have care for these complex tumors. So uh, uh, Dr. BZ and Dr. Iyer and the administration uh, wanted to get this going here at Hogue. And so um, that's why I'm here. So um, just a little bit of background. I'm from Boston originally, did my residency at University of Virginia, which is one of the kind of meccas for uh, neurosurgery. Um, and then I went on to do two fellowships. I did an, a, a fellowship in advanced uh, cranial surgery in Auckland, New Zealand, and then I did another fellowship in minimally invasive skull-based surgery um, at John Wayne Cancer Institute, uh, and then joined Hogue about 18 months ago. So I'm gonna be talking uh, to you guys a bit today. Is the audio okay? Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm gonna be talking to you guys today about what I do, um, what, what this is my passion, uh, minimally invasive neurosurgery, and how we're using uh, new techniques and new technologies uh, to drive better outcomes uh, for neurosurgical patients. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have any financial disclosures at this point. I'd like, to, I'd like to gather some. If anybody has any suggestions, I'm open to it. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit of background about uh, brain tumor categorization, what are the different types of brain tumors and pituitary tumors, and then we're gonna go, most of the talk is gonna be about the techniques and the treatment. So um, basically, there's a couple of different ways to categorize brain tumors. Uh, one of the ways is to, to categorize them versus, as primary versus secondary. So are they a brain tumor or a tumor that arose in a brain or one of its supporting, in the brain or one of its supporting structures, or is it a secondary or metastatic tumor spread from colon, breast, lung, uh, some other source in the body? Um, another way of categorizing them is, you know, the benign to malignant, of course, grading scale one to four. Um, and, and all of these things matter uh, substantially uh, uh, to affect the patient outcome. The other thing that we look at in the brain is whether they are what's called intraaxial or inside the substance of the brain or extraaxial, arising, you know, in the dura or the surrounding skull and pushing on the brain. And that also matters substantially uh, because of the, the ability to differentiate tissue um, and ability to separate them away from the brain safely. Uh, so th these tumors can arise from the skull base, the meninges, uh, the, the different vessels and cranial nerves, and push inward on the brain. Uh, so there's a lot of different subtypes of primary brain tumors, uh, gliomas, most of you have heard of, uh, the worst of these being glioblastoma, uh, which is a very terrible type of brain tumor that most uh, nobody really survives from. This one Ted Kennedy died of and Bo Biden died of. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a disease we are making slow and little progress with. On the other end of the spectrum is something meningium was a completely benign tumor, but depending on the location can cause dramatic effects, including significant neurological morbidity for the patients by compressing and surrounding normal neural structures and making them difficult to remove surgically. Uh, pituitary adenoma is another one we're gonna talk about. Again, a benign tumor, very, very common, uh, but uh, uncommonly needs treatment. Um, so all of the, br the primary brain tumors together, gliomas, meningiomas, pituitary tumors, about 62,000 new cases per year in the United States. By comparison, metastatic tumors to the brain is about 200,000 new cases per year. So of all tumors to the brain, by a factor of more than three to one, metastases are more common than primary brain tumors. So something to keep into account. But with metastatic tumors particularly, we've made great advances in, in, in our ability to treat these, both surgically and uh, non-operatively. Um, uh, so when talking about metastases, they have a tendency to go to the brain mainly based on the volume of blood that goes to those different tissues. So it's not surprising that 80 to 85 percent of, of metastases are found in the cerebral hemispheres. That's 80 to 85 percent of the volume of the brain. Similarly, the cerebellum is about 15 percent and the brain stem is about 5 percent. There's no magic to this, it's just based on blood flow. Um, this is, though, important. About 50 to 80% of cases will have multiple brain metastases at the time of presentation. And that substantially affects their outcome and their prognosis. And sometimes it affects the treatment that we, that we choose. And then the leptomeningeal stage, when they spread over the surface of the brain and actually into the spinal fluid, is kind of the late stage and a very, very serious. And it's, you know, it makes the patients very sick. There's not a lot we can do about it. And, and, and even the treatments when they get to this, this stage are are, are, are fraught with morbidity. What happened? 
So um, just a little bit about the types of tumors that go to the brain. The most common is small cell lung cancer. Greater than 50% of patients with small cell lung cancer will have brain metastases. Often this is how it's diagnosed. Um, Non-small cell lung cancer, about 40% will have brain metastases. Melanoma, um, up to 75% of patients with metastatic melanoma will have brain metastases at the time of autopsy. Again, melanoma is commonly the first diagnosis is from, from a brain metastasis. Um, the, the other ones, although breast cancer is very common, it doesn't as often go to the brain. Uh, same with colon cancer, very common, but doesn't go to the brain as commonly as, as, as lung or melanoma. And then some of the less common tumors, thyroid, prostate. Uh, prostate very rarely goes to the brain. It does go to the skull base, however, and, uh, and can uh, cause significant morbidity for that reason. Um, so overall, we, we talked a bit about prevalence and incidence, so the incidence of, of new brain tumors uh, every year um, uh, versus the prevalence of total number of cases. Um, so these are based a couple of different ways of obtaining this data on imaging studies. So the prevalence of these things has been rising because we're doing more MRIs. Somebody has a headache, they get an MRI. Their toe hurts, they get an MRI. So we're finding more and more of them. That doesn't necessarily mean that, th that the actual occurrence of them is increasing. It just means that our rate of detection is increasing. And this is all pretty common sense. Um, and then autopsy studies, you know, particularly the melanoma data comes from autopsy studies demonstrating the high prevalence of brain metastasis in melanoma patients. Um, so this is a breakdown uh, of, now, now we're talking about primary brain tumors alone, um, going past metastases into primary brain tumors, which we're going to spend the majority of the, of the talk of, talking about. The most common primary brain tumor is a benign one, a meningioma, um, about seven cases per 100,000 per year, which is about 23,000 new cases per year. Um, second most common is gliomas. This includes glioblastoma, which by far makes up the majority of these. Um, and then the third one is pituitary adenoma. Um, this is the third, you know, about three cases per 100,000 per year. The important thing with this is these are cases that require surgical treatment. About one in seven people has a pituitary tumor. One, so if there's, you know, 50 people in this room, that's three or four people in this room will have a pituitary tumor. Um, the vast majority of them need, don't need any treatment at all, and we'll, you'll never know about it uh, unless it grows or starts to cause you symptoms. But so if you imagine 15% of the population has a pituitary tumor, but only three per 100,000 require surgery, uh, it's obviously very important to decide to have strict criteria who needs surgery and who doesn't, and what are those criteria. Um, this is the same slide. So by comparison, just to, to kind of sh give you an idea, you know, meningioma is 23,000 cases a year. Breast cancer every year, 290,000 new cases. That's in, these data are a little older, but uh, you get the idea. More than 10 to 1 um, for, for um, you know, for breast cancer and the same for prostate cancer. So breast cancer being the most common uh, tumor in women, prostate cancer being the most common cancerous tumor in men. Um, these each outnumber all primary brain tumors together by a factor of five to one, four or five to one. Uh, so, you know, overall, not nearly as common, doesn't affect nearly as wide of a swath of the population, but uh, sometimes the treatment can be a lot more difficult. If you're taking out a tumor in the breast, you can remove the whole breast. You, you're taking out a tumor in the dominant frontal lobe, you can't remove the whole dominant frontal lobe, or at least the patient doesn't want you to. Uh, so we have to develop innovative ways to remove the tumor safely without affecting the surrounding normal brain. This is just a little bit of a different way of looking at it. Of all, of all primary tumors of the brain, um, the, the, the uh, meningiomas make up the biggest piece of the pie, about 35%. Pituitary tumors, about 15%. The majority of what I do, I, I do treat malignant tumors as well, but the majority of what I do focuses on treating benign tumors of the brain. And the reason for that is uh, they're benign tumors, but they occur in difficult locations which are centrally located within the head. Everybody knows the pituitary gland, if you took the head as a sphere, is right in the center of the sphere. Uh, and it's surrounded by the most critical structures that we have in the body, the bilateral carotid arteries on each side, the basilar artery in the back, the brain stem in the back, the optic chiasm above, and the pituitary gland and hypothalamus itself. So um, the, despite uh, not representing a huge percentage of the population, uh, it does require specific techniques and technology and experience and expertise in order to address these tumors safely. Uh, this is a, just a kind of a, a graph um, demonstrating the, uh, the, the incidence of brain tumors uh, as people age. So obviously all types of brain tumors, the incidence goes up. You know, they're very uncommon uh, in children. And as you get older and older, the incidence, the cumulative
of insulin incidence increases. Um, gliomas actually tend to drop off a little bit. Meningiomas continue to rise uh, as you get up into your 70s and 80s. Um, it, this is an important slide. So tumors of the pituitary, although the, although the third most common type of primary tumor, represent the most common primary brain tumor in people 15 to 35. These are young people, you know, in high school, college, beginning their working years, uh, and can have dramatic effects. And similarly, as, as you get into the kind of middle, middle life or, you know, working functional years, the golden years, whatever you would like to call them, uh, the, the, it is, becomes the second most common with meningioma taking over as the, the first most common tumor in those age groups. Uh, again, I, these are benign tumors, but because of their location can be very difficult to treat. And then, of course, glioblastoma starts to arise as we get into our 50s, and that's a, you know, a bad player. Uh, again, we've looked at these numbers, the incidence of pituitary tumors overall in the United States, about 11,000 new pituitary tumors every year in the United States. That's 1,200 in California. These are patients that require surgically, surgically treated uh, pituitary tumors. So I'm going to now kind of, now that we've kind of given the background, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of surgery for brain tumors, uh, and then quickly kind of fast forward to where we are now. So it was 1885 when the first documented case of surgery for a, a brain tumor was done uh, in England. Um, the, based on the symptoms of, of uh, right arm, sorry, left arm and hand weakness, uh, they, without any imaging, localized correctly the tumor to the right. Uh, uh, pre-central gyrus to the motor strip, um, and then were accurately able to localize the tumor entirely based on symptoms and successfully remove it using surface landmarks. This is in 1885. Um, they were able to uh, do this without any neurological harm to the patient is actually strength in his arm improved. The patient actually ended up dying four weeks later from infection. This is before antibiotics, before antiseptic technique. Uh, but the important lesson from this is that it is indeed possible that for the first time in history to intervene on the human brain and have potentially, under better circumstances, long-lasting benefit to the patient. So that was then, 120, just over 125 years ago, and we think we've come a long way. So this is now. This is the, quote, modern era of neurosurgery, and this is where how most neurosurgical cases are done in almost every center uh, in the country. Uh, I would say 95% of craniotomies or surgery for, uh, for tumors are done with this kind of approach, these horribly huge disfiguring incisions with infections of the bone flap. Uh, it, it was kind of the adage of neurosurgeons that, you know, we're, well, we, we think we're kind of a big deal, so we, we, don't, we beat our chest and get in there and get the tumor out, and we don't really care what the patient looks like or how they do afterwards. We got the tumor out. Uh, and that's not right. Uh, patients don't like it, and uh, so we can do better. Uh, so uh, one of the things I'm involved in is constantly trying to advance uh, the minimally invasive techniques for removal of these tumors so that, they, that, that, we can imp that we can improve their outcomes. We can disturb less of their normal tissue. So we've been blessed in the last 15 years, even in the last one year, Year with dramatic technical and technological advances that have helped uh, speed this process along. Uh, this, one of the major advances, which is actually about 20 years old now, is the use of navigation. Basically, it's a GPS system, which we use for the brain, allows us to very accurately localize uh, where the tips of our instruments are within the brains within 0.1 millimeter of accuracy. Uh, so it allows us to know exactly where we are, even if the field is, is, is clouded by blood or tissue. Um, tractography, this allows us to not only visualize the anatomical structures of the brain, but the functional white matter tracks, the motor pathways, the speech pathways, the visual pathways. So that if we know where they are, if we know where they are, we're able to avoid them and take a different approach. Refined instrumentation, this is something we're working on all the time. Lower profile, thinner instruments that allow us to work through smaller openings, through smaller access. Um, using this Doppler vessel probe to actually listen for where the vessels are. Even if we can't see them, we can listen to know, okay, yeah, that's the anterior cerebral on the back side of it. I have to be careful as I go over the top of this tumor. Uh, and then high definition endoscopy. These blood vessels on the surface of the optic chiasm are probably 0.1 millimeter in diameter. Anywhere else in the body, a, a vessel of that caliber is not going to mean anything to you. Even the larger ones probably wouldn't mean anything in your heart or your liver or your colon. Uh, but at, in this location, 
you take one of these little blood vessels and they're going to have a visual field cut. If you take one of the larger ones, they're going to have a dense visual field, you know, bitemporal hemianopsia, like with a horse with blinders on. Uh, and that's debilitating for patients. The, you, the patients often actually, sometimes when they, if it comes on slowly, don't notice it. But if it happens during surgery and you're not able to see these vessels and preserve them, uh, they can be dramatic, severe, negative consequences for the patient. So these technological advances have been advancing for the last 15 years. Years. Um, and endoscopy is something that neurosurgeons are behind the curve with. The general surgeons have been using endoscopy for 50 years to take out gallbladders and, and appendices. Uh, we only now, in the last five years, are starting to use endoscopy in neurosurgery, and it's because of our egos. We think that, oh, well, those guys, you know, that's, that's not good enough for neurosurgery. You know, we, we need to use our own things. And what, finally, people are starting to put their egos aside and allow uh, us to learn from other specialties. Maybe we have something to learn from these guys. Maybe it's a good idea to use a, a you know, a Maybe it's a good idea to use an endoscope. So we're going to talk about how these, this idea has evolved, even in the last year. So the idea of, of, of endoscopy using both, both the source of light and the, the, the optics into the hole versus a microscope where the, the light is limited by the size of the hole allows you to work through a smaller channel. If you introduce the endoscope into the opening, you can illuminate the entire field, whereas the microscope, by the nature of its size, has to have a larger opening in order to access the, the, the field of view. There's also angled endoscopes, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 70 degrees, which allow us to look around corners and be able to work through tiny little openings in order to remove uh, these tumors. So this, the, the kind of poster child for this was the endoscopic endonasal approach, using the nose to access initially the pituitary and then tumors and a wide range of mid-line tumors extending all the way from the frontal sinus to the craniocervical junction. We're able to remove all of these type of tumors, neuro, uh, esthesioneuroblastomas, um, pituitary tumors, meningiomas, chordomas, uh, all, the, all through a naturally occurring orifice without any incision on the body. This is relatively amazing if you consider, uh, the, you know, the amount of work and the, the level of, of, of detail and the critical nature of the structures that are involved in this region. So the endoscopic endonasal approach is kind of the poster child that we've, uh, we, we've learned from. So a typical kind of case with that is a, you know, a patient with a pituitary tumor. Uh, we had a 52-year-old female came in with six months of progressive visual loss. The pituitary sits right underneath the optic chiasm, so as the tumors grow, it compresses the chiasm and they get like a horse with blinders, their vision just gets narrower and narrower in tunnel vision. Um, and so this woman had about, for about six months, headaches and fatigue, which are pretty common, and 150 pound weight gain over three years. Uh, this is from pituitary hypofunction from compression of her pituitary gland. So this is her tumor, this coronal image is showing the pituitary tumor here. They often look like a snowman like this, carotid artery on either side, and the optic chiasm stretched way up over the top of the tumor like this. You can't see it in this sequence, but uh, it's, that's, in this case, the chiasm should rest about right here, and it's stretched way up, which is what gives you that uh, tunnel vision. This is a sagittal view of the same, showing the brain stem behind, basilar artery here, uh, and this is the kind of snowman tumor here. So this is the field that we see at surgery. I'm going to show you a video of, of how the surgery is done, but this is a essentially what we're, what we're looking at, the carotid arteries on either side, optic, left optic nerve, right optic nerve, optic chiasm, anterior cerebral arteries, anterior communicating artery, all in a space about uh, two square centimeters, so you know, a little less than a, a square inch. So we're going to talk, I'm going to show you the video of, of how we take this tumor out. Of course, it's not going to embed, so I'm going to have to show it from here. So we are, we are looking now at the cellar dura. This is the dura of the cellar, cella. Um, we're opening up the covering of the pituitary here. Your carotid arteries are on either side here. Um, this now, we're lifting the dura up. This is the normal pituitary. You can tell because it has these little nice vertically oriented vessels. And we're releasing the dura away. There's normal pituitary. There's always a thin rim of normal pituitary gland over the tumor, which is important for us to identify and preserve. So we start to separate, very carefully se separate that from the tumor itself. Sometimes we have to cut a, a away a bit so we don't have a flap of tissue. Completely safe to remove this. We've demonstrated it in over 400 patients. Uh, none of them showed a pituitary deficit from, from removal of a small wedge of the pituitary like that. And then we start to circumferentially dissect around the tumor. The key here is preserving the capsule of the tumor. 
tumor. Uh, if you preserve the capsule and able to dissect it, uh, removing it on block, you're, you know that you've got the whole thing out. You don't even have to look back afterwards. If you preserve, we're lifting the normal pituitary up here, gently, gently pulling the tumor down away from normal pituitary above, tumor below, very carefully, this is about four hours worth of work condensed down into about two minutes, um, but very carefully peeling it away, taking care to preserve that capsule rather than the traditional approach of just sucking it out because if you don't preserve the capsule, you don't know that you've got it all. Here I am removing it. The right carotid artery is right here within the cavernous sinus. We're starting to come up over the top of the tumor towards the back. This is again pituitary gland up here. We're still just start to see the little divot above the in the pituitary where the pituitary stalk or infundibulum comes in. But you can see this nice smooth surface of the, of the tumor. The goal again being to remove the whole tumor in one piece and be able to pull it out through the nose. The, the key again to that is knowing that you've got the whole tumor. About 25% of what I do is redos uh, from other people who have not taken the whole tumor out. So right carotid artery, left carotid artery, pituitary gland, the little divot there where the pituitary stalk attaches. We're going to get a post-op MRI on this patient, but I know she's cured. There's no way that tumor's coming back when you do that extra capsular approach like that. So uh, the, this patient tolerated the surgery well, uh, no complications. She was discharged home on postoperative day two. The visual recovery in these patients, particularly with pituitary adenomas, is remarkable. They wake up in the PACU and their vision is better. Um, and they're like, I'm, I'm amazed I can see. They didn't know how bad their vision was until they can finally see again. Uh, her, her hormone function recovered to normal, uh, and these are the results. So this is pre-op uh, with the tumor and post-op with complete removal of the tumor. This is actually the normal pituitary gland here. In this case, the, there's a fat graft in the space tenting the space up. Sometimes if we either have a CSF leak or uh, in order to avoid this, the gland herniating down, we put a, a little piece of fat from the belly in there to support the gland. If the gland descends too quickly, it will, will put traction in the pituitary stalk and, and can result in diabetes insipidus. So it's important to kind of support the gland and make sure it descends slowly over time. Again, pre-op and post-op. Um, uh, and this is the kind of typical pituitary adenoma. So we've used the skills that we've learned through pituitary surgery and now taken them into other fields of neurosurgery. So year one, I, we, we, the pituitary program was started here in September of 2014. Uh, year one, we did the 51 cases in our first year, which was a 1,300% increase from the prior year. Um, we had, of patients with preoperative visual decline with pituitary adenomas, we had a 100% uh, improvement uh, in, in their visual deficit. That doesn't mean they returned to 100% normal. That means 100% of patients had a documented visual improvement. Um, no patients had new neurological deficits of the pituitary adenomas. 82% uh, had improvement in their pituitary function, which is right in line with the literature, and the infection rates were very low. Uh, I think I kind of got lucky in my first year because, uh, you know, th this is going to happen. It's just a matter of time um, before some of these things start to pile up. But uh, we're happy with how the results are going so far. So now we're carrying these skills uh, and building Hogue into a center of excellence for pituitary surgery. So that doesn't just mean that we have a surgeon that knows how to do pituitary surgery. The key here is having a multidisciplinary team, having myself as the surgeon. I have an auto, uh, ENT surgeon who does the approach for me, who takes care to protect the nose. Endocrinologist to look after these patients, some of whom have functional tumors, some of whom have uh, deficits before and after surgery. Neuro-ophthalmologist to be able to very carefully and accurately uh, diagnose their visual uh, symptoms and sometimes, if necessary, with different approaches, uh, work together for surgery. Neuroradiologists who are trained in examining these types of tumors. Uh, the, we all get together every Friday and have meetings and have our tumor board and discuss these cases because it's not just we do what I think, we all get together and everybody has a say. It's the team, it's the multidisciplinary team that makes it into a center of excellence. And uh, we are uh, actively being, uh, um, working towards establishing ourselves as the only uh, uh, center of excellence for pituitary surgery in Orange County. Um, uh, and as you can see, the other kind of other players on this list, UCLA, Cedars-Sinai, uh, Barrow Neurological Institute, these are major uh, academic quaternary referral centers. Uh, so for us to be kind of getting into this group, uh, is, is a real accomplishment, it's something I'm really proud of. Um, so, you know, we celebrate, we, before we throw our caps in the air though, we remember that uh, 
commencement. This is just the beginning. Uh, we're, we're, just, we're just learning about this. We're just, just introducing these things. Uh, and so now we're using these things, skills that we've learned in one area and taking them on to others. So beyond the pituitary, uh, surgery for other types of skull-based tumors, meningiomas, um, chordomas, uh, chondrosarcomas. Uh, there's many different approaches that make up the realm of what's called keyhole surgery. So uh, just like looking through a keyhole, if you put your eye up to the hole, it doesn't matter how small the hole is, you'll still be able to see completely what's on the other side. So if you're able to work through that small hole, you're able to accomplish the same thing, but through much less disruption uh, of normal tissue. So the idea is preserving all of the patient's tissue, not just their brain, but their scalp. The scalp is there for a reason, to protect from infection. It's the number one barrier against infection is the skin. Protecting the bone, the muscle, the nerves, the vascular supply is critical. And so we use the combination of techniques and technology in order to advance these approaches. So the idea, when you know, I kind of this is kind of a funny slide, but I tell people that when, when my goal for surgery is not to you know, get in there and show, well, I was there, but I got the tumor out, is to kind of sneak in and sneak out and leave the patient as undisturbed as I can. I want them to walk out of my office the same way they walked in or better, you know, minus the tumor. So um, one of these techniques that we use is a superorbital technique. Uh, instead of making this big incision across the top of the head, uh, we make a small incision which is hidden within the eyebrow, make a craniotomy about the size of a quarter, uh, sneak underneath the frontal lobe, and it gives us access to a wide variety of pathologies, including aneurysms, uh, tumors compressing the optic chiasm, tumors in the third ventricle, tumors in the anterior aspect of the brain stem near the midbrain. Uh, the difference is, instead of having this huge incision, so this is the, what the incision looks like hidden within the eyebrow, instead of having this huge incision, which is typically a week in the hospital, 500 cc's of blood loss or more, lots of post-operative pain, you can have this. And I always challenge people to tell me which eye you know, I went through. You, the scar is nearly invisible, uh, hidden within the eyebrow. It's not so much about the cosmetic effect, although in Newport Beach, people tend to care about that a little, little more than most places. Um, it, it's about d not disturbing natural tissue. It's there for a reason. The skin is there for a reason. It's not there just because it's in my way. It's there for a reason. So we try to preserve as much of it as we possibly can. This also includes the use of, of techniques uh, using natural corridors and kind of untraditional. This is a technique where we go from the one side of the brain through, in, through the inter, in, inner hemispheric fissure to, to take out a tumor on the other side of the brain. Because traditionally, you'd either have to go through this brain overlying it or retract it in order to get to a tumor in this location. Well, it just makes sense that if you put the patient with their head down and open up this dura here, the CSF will drain out, this hemisphere will fall away without any retraction at all, and it lets you get a much straighter shot using a 30 degree angled endoscope uh, at, at taking that tumor out. Similarly, for tumors of the occipital lobe, rather than going through the visual cortex and ruining their vision, we can sneak in on top of the cerebellum and then go through the tentorium to get to these deep-seated occ occ occipital tumors. It's just about kind of putting together the anatomical knowledge and the technology uh, in order to affect better outcomes. This is an example of one of the that we call the transfalcine approach, going through the falks. So we go from the patient's right side towards the left, go in, let this space open up, take the tumor out like we're showing here, and this is the post-operative result. You can see the overlying brain on both sides is completely undisturbed. So that's the point, is to take out the tumor and only the tumor and not meet, leave you know, a path in our wake that is destroying whatever their natural tissue, in this case brain, would be. Uh, so this is, again, the same patient with this large tumor, which would normally require, uh, this is the motor co cortex for the leg directly overlying this that would, would, would require, uh, would end up with a, a deficit, leg weakness. Instead, the patient walks out of the hospital two days later. So now we kind of come to the even newer part. These are, I'm going to introduce a couple of technologies, one of which we just got a couple of months here at Hogue, but which is absolutely a game changer for neurosurgery. Uh, so the four definition endoscopy, we 4K HD endoscopy we talked about. Uh, the next two te technologies, the brain path and the surgical theater in the end, um, th these, I cannot overstate the importance of these in, in increasing the safety and efficacy of minimally invasive neurosurgery. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the brain path. What this is, uh, is essentially a port for brain surgery. 
They, you know, taking out a gallbladder, they use a port. They, you know, taking out the appendix, as far as I know, they work through a port. Now with some of the thoracic surgeries, they're working through a port. Well, we can do the same thing in the brain, it's just we didn't get the idea. We had to, you know, realize it's okay to use someone else's idea. So now, uh, using a combination of advanced imaging techniques and this thing right here, this is called the, the brain port, this is the cannula, which is essentially uh, literally a port that we dock down into the brain uh, in, in order to remove deep-seated tumors without disturbing the surrounding cortex. The diameter of this is about the size of a dime. So we're working through a working channel the size of a dime as opposed to making this big you know, craniotomy with the huge incision, taking off half their skull, destroying a bunch of normal brain on the way in. We're able to remove t tumors deeply seated within the brain, including in the third ventricle, in the thalamus, um, uh, through, through using this minimally invasive port technique. Um, but it requires a, a number of different technologies, uh, advanced optics, the HD cameras, which allow us to see around corners. Uh, there's this device called a Nico, which is essentially a little a device that bites the tissue as we go, um, all of which we're able to accomplish through this opening the size of a dime. So uh, th again, this is the device. I, I, I normally have one that I bring with me to, to pass around, and I can't seem to find it. But again, it's, you know, it, it looks just like this. I mean, this is it. You know, you, what we do is we open up the sulcus, we do, using navigation, we dock it down into the brain. Now the key is, we're using these advanced imaging techniques. This is diffusion tensor imaging, which is an MRI technique which allows us to visualize the white matter pathways of the brain. So it's not just important that we get the, get the, the, the dock, the, the port onto the tumor, it's important that we don't transect an important pathway on the way in. So sometimes this requires choosing an angle which would otherwise not seem reasonable because it allows us to avoid transecting an important path. That may be a longer path. It's not necessarily that the shortest route to the tumor is the best one. It's that the one that avoids the important pathways, the arcuate fasciculus for speech, the motor pathways, the speech pathways, the superior long longitudinal fasciculus. Avoiding these pathways and using the combination of the port, the brain path, plus advanced imaging techniques really does improve outcomes. Uh, the, um, this is kind of the view that we see as we're operating down the port, so the instruments are all bayoneted, so we're able to see over the top of them and down into the, uh, into the, into the port. Uh, and this is some of the early results that are coming out. So this is a length of stay, so this is typical uh, uh, length of stay for a patient with a, with a metastatic brain tumor, a deep-seated metastatic brain tumor, average about four and a half, five days, uh, and with the brain path, uh, they're staying just over two days. So by length of stay alone, we're cutting the length of stay in half. This matters for a lot of reasons. Patients Stay, sit around the hospital, they get sick, they get urinary tract infections, they get C. diff. Uh, patients are better off at home. So if we can get them home in shorter time, and the reason is because they have less blood loss, they have less pain, they have fewer neurologic complications, and so they're able to go home. So this is a quote from Dr. J.D. Day, who's a chairman at Arkansas. Um, he's kind of, which is one of the meccas of skull-based surgery. Uh, the, 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 he, he coins the brain path procedure as the closest that we can get to precisely targeted, flawless surgery for deep brain tumors. And we're able to get to the tumors in a safer way, putting patients at less risk for brain damage and preserving critical structures and tracts. This is the key. I mean, this is what we all want to do. It, Neurosurgeons cringe at the idea of cutting into, or at least should cringe at the idea of cutting into normal brain or normal neural structures, even if it's to get to something deeper. So the less wake we can leave, the better off we are. Um, finally, um, we're going to spend the last part of the talk talking about surgical theater. This is something I'm really passionate about. Uh, this is a system we have brought on board at Hogue just in January. Uh, this is the 22nd century of neurosurgery. We now have 3D virtual reality guidance for neurosurgery, which allows us, this is based on the F-16 flight simulator technology, allows us to do a, a virtual reality fly-through of the operation before we actually touch the patient in 3D. And at the end of the talk, we brought the system here today. You guys are going to get a chance to come up and trial it to, to just to see, you know, play around, fly through the brain. I can show you a couple cases if we have some time. Uh, but you can put the goggles on and see what we actually see at surgery. It's, it's literally, it's, it's amazing. So I'm going to just show a little bit of a video. Um, this is a promotional video that we, we made for the, for the surgical theater for Hogue. Um, The surgical theater is a three-dimensional intraoperative navigation technology which allows us to reconstruct the surgical images for the individual patient and really enable us to tailor a specific surgical approach to that patient. Before 
We looked at landmarks on the surface of the skull. We looked at you know, where the eyes were, where the ear was. We drew a line between them and then we moved up two centimeters and that's approximately where the tumor was. They would put up a, you know, one image that was uh, looking straight at you, another image looking from the side, and another image looking from the top, the different planes of view, but you know, this, the, the surgeon still had to you know, interpolate that and put everything together to make their own internal 3D vision of things. Now, with the advent of surgical theater, which is based on three-dimensional flight simulator technology from F-16s, it allows us to do a three-dimensional reconstruction of the image before surgery. What this enables is, is for us to do an actual fly-through in virtual reality of the surgery before actually laying hands on the patient. So this enables us to dramatically increase the margin of safety for these individual patients. In fact, just last week, we had a case where, based on the three-dimensional reconstruction, we actually had to change the ap surgical approach that we use in order to get a better approach, a better access, a better corridor to the tumor. This dramatically increases the protection of the natural tissues, including preserving normal brain tissue, normal blood vessels, and the surrounding tissues of the skull, bone, soft tissue, and skin itself. It allows for increasingly minimally invasive approaches, uh, which are better for patients. They have fewer complications, shorter hospital stays, less blood loss, and better overall outcomes. We're the first center in Orange County to have it. In fact, we're the first private hospital west of the Mississippi to have it. So it's amazing that we've been able to bring this here to Hogue. And it's because we've got such a great community surrounding us that are interested in advancing, the, pushing the, the perimeters of medicine and making things better and safer for the patients. I mean, this is the era that we live in, using these rapidly advancing technologies to increase the safety and efficacy of what we do and allowing us to tailor it to each individual patient. And now, now that we've brought it here, I mean, it's, it's becoming rapidly integrated into our, in our, our part of our daily routine. Obviously, you know, this kind of investment, this kind of technology is relatively expensive, and we're fortunate that Hogue was able to put forward the investment because they saw a future. They saw us building a future for virtual reality guided neurosurgery around the surgical theater. And be able, be looking forward to advancing this technology and integrating into our daily practice and being able to educate patients with it and increase the margin of safety and specifically tailor our approach. Fortunately, we live in a community where the patients really take ownership of, of our hospital and it elevates us from being a run-of-the-mill community hospital to really a center of excellence for this kind of care. And it, it, it's, it's only because that the hospital and the administration and the team here is willing to put forward the investment. Just, not just the financial investment, but the investment in people, the investment in time in order to bring these things to fruition. So that's just kind of an introduction to what the system does. Um, it, it, like I said, this is a this is a game changer for neurosurgery because it allows us to personalize the surgery to each individual patient. This the this video is I'm going to walk you through this case. This is a case which we actually was written up in the Orange County Register. Um, this is a patient that had a tumor. Traditional MRI images we see in two dimensions. You've all seen MRIs. It's like looking through a flip book. You see, you know, slice, 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 like an old cartoon from Disney that you had to kind of flip through and see in two dimensions. You know, here's the little tumor right here uh, underneath the optic nerve. Um, and based on these two dimensional images, um, I was planning an approach. I was planning to use the eyebrow approach to go through the eyebrow. This is a CT angiogram showing the same. You can see these, they're black and white. They force the surgeons to view things in the eye of a radiologist. But that's not how we do things. And, and patients in surgery aren't positioned in exact perpendicular planes. Their head is tilted back and rotated. So now this is the reconstruction of this patient. And when doing the preoperative fly through the morning of surgery, I actually realized that the surgical corridor that I was planning was not going to allow me access that I needed to get the tumor out. You can see we, when we construct the surgical corridor, which this allows us to do, we're able to build in the craniotomy and then actually use a virtual drill to drill, the, to, to drill the bone out, allowing us access to what we would see at the time of surgery. Then we can fly in, zoom in, and see. I could see that based on this, I'd be able to get to this part of the tumor, but there's a little bit right down here, which this is the superior orbital fissure, which I was not gonna be able to get. So the morning of surgery, I changed my plan. I changed my approach and went, said, Let, what, let's see if we do it this way. Let's see if we're gonna be able to get to it. And by what we call a mini terion, a little incision behind the hairline, I was able to access the entire tumor uh, and get a straight on view of it. Then what I can do is position the patient 
as they're going to be positioned in surgery so that I can go through and say, okay, yes, when I come to this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to the anterior cerebral artery, and then I'm going to come around this corner. And instead of having to imagine that in my mind, I can actually do it in the virtual reality system. This is like you know, a, a, a fighter jet pilot fly, doing a fly-through mission in a simulator. Uh, I, this is a game changer. I mean, it really, really does make an enormous difference. Just for this one patient alone, it actually made a difference in whether we got the whole tumor out or not. So the interesting thing was that if you change the plan for surgery the morning of for a patient, they're, they're like, what are you doing? I, you know, they, they get scared. So how do we solve that? We brought the system out into the pre-op area and said, listen, this is what we did. We flew him through. I showed him on the system. This is what we were planning. This is why it's not going to work. Here's what we're doing. Here is why it's going to work. Uh, and this patient, uh, so you know, we did it. Uh, he's like, yeah, totally makes sense. We did it. Um, and by the following Friday, I think he ran 10 miles the Friday after surgery. So uh, I mean, it just the, the recovery time is remarkable because we're able to be so much more precise uh, with our openings that it, it just doesn't leave patients uh, debilitated. It, le it leaves them with better outcomes. It leads them uh, to, to be home quicker and functioning at a, at a better level. So yeah, this, you know, this, this was the guy was so excited, you know, he, he kind of, we want to get the word out about this. Again, we're the only hospital in Orange County to have this. We're the only uh, non-academic hospital west of the Mississippi. There's only 10, 10 hospitals in the country to have this. It is a, it's a remarkable leap forward because it's allowing us, again, we're talking about 3D virtual reality guided neurosurgery. This is the first time you know, ever that this has happened, and it is such a big leap forward. Uh, you know, you feel you're going from two-dimensional black and white images to three-dimensional virtual reality color images that you can manipulate uh, and drive through and drill away structures and move structures out of your way so you can know exactly what you're going to be able to do with surgery uh, and, and, and improve the safety of it. So kind of putting it all together, uh, this is a patient, uh, that w just the, one more video here, Put, this is a patient that came in through the ER, um, came in with double vision. Uh, he had double vision uh, with a right sixth nerve palsy. So it was about, I think he was 41, a 41-year-old guy came into the ER with, with double vision um, and uh, couldn't look to the right. This is his tumor here, this enormous skull-based tumor wrapping around both carotid arteries, wrapping around the basilar artery, uh, compressing all of the, the brain stem posteriorly, the pituitary, the hypothalamus. So you can see in the two dimensions what we saw. Now you're going to be able to see the difference between seeing it in two dimensions and three dimensions and how we build in the surgical corridor and accomplish what we really want to accomplish. Normally this type of tumor is exceedingly complex, uh, you know, but by allowing us to do the navigation and practice the operation in advance, it allows us to, number one, get more of the tumor out. See, this is me going into the patient's brain, flying in, looking around. There's the basilar artery on the back of the tumor. There's where it splits into the posterior cerebral arteries. Here's the carotid artery running up through the side of the tumor. Uh, the other carotid artery here in the cavernous sinus. We're able to navigate through, and I can do it through the surgical corridor. I can try out other surgical corridors. I can look from above. You could never do that. I mean, this, you don't get to do that on normal people, on humans. The, the only way we can do this is with this technology. And so what it does is normally that kind of tumor, you'd be able to get 20, 30, 40% of it out, and they'd get radiation. Well, in this particular case, um, because of the navigation in part, 10 hours of surgery later, um, and uh, this is the post-operative uh, reconstruction of his, of his um, tumor with a near total resection. I said we probably got about 98% of this tumor out. There was a little tongue down by the, by the C12 junction that we didn't get out. And this patient left the hospital completely normal three days later. He had recovery of his sixth nerve. Uh, it almost brings me to tears to, to, to see that the, the kind of results that we're able to achieve by putting all of these things together. And kind of even more important than that, and I've talked a lot about the technology, but even more important than that, um, is this. This is, that patient uh, that presented with double vision was an artist. Uh, he was blind in one eye from birth, and his other eye was now going, you know, turning laterally, so he couldn't see, I mean, literally he was developing, he had a little bit of vision in his one eye, and the other eye is now, his good eye, which he uses to paint and take pictures with, is deviated out, so it's becoming useless. 
after the surgery, it restored, and he painted this for me, and it's hanging on my wall in my office. And more than anything else, more than all the technology, the fact that we're able to restore this to this patient, and he's able to paint the, the, these blades of grass uh, uh, after a surgery like this, which would leave people, mo uh, even five years ago, leave people devastated, uh, that he's able to have this kind of function, uh, again, it, it, th th there really isn't anything else to say. Uh, th this, is, this is why we do what we do. Uh, this is why I get so excited about this, because really, I feel like, th you know, when I went into this, you know, when I started doing this, th this is the kind of thing I was hoping for, not to have patients that, yeah, a good outcome is that they can raise, you know, raise an arm. A good outcome is to be able to see and draw these blades of grass. Uh, and, and that's really what we're looking for. That's why putting the techniques and the technology together uh, is so important, uh, and it's what we're trying to do here. And uh, again, I, I think we're just at the beginning. So thanks uh, for all of your uh, uh, attention. And uh, we're going we're gonna to have the system, the surgical theater system loaded up over here, and we'll put up a couple of cases. And if anybody wants to come and just take a look at it or put the goggles on and fly through, um, uh, you're welcome to. But uh, I can also take any questions that you may have. Thanks for your attention. Does anybody have any questions or you want to come up and play? Alex, you want to? So we're going to load up the system if anybody wants to come up and take a look at, at the kind of, kind of things we're doing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, truly amazing. Thanks again.